Pantajaha. Welcome to another episode of Second Gen's Liberated Panda. Today we have a very special guest. You might remember her from the award-winning documentary, First Vote, directed by Dr. Yi Chen, who we interviewed two weeks ago. I'm here with Professor Jennifer Ho, who is a professor in the Department of Ethics, Studies, and Director of Humanities and Art at the University of Colorado. Thank you for joining us today on Liberated Panda. It's an honor to have you here today. It's nice to be here. So before you became the Director of Humanities and Art at the University of Colorado Boulder, you were a professor at the University, University of North Carolina Chapel Hill. So what made you make that transition? And can you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Yeah, sure. So I um, was 17 years at UNC Chapel Hill, where I was a professor in the Department of English and Comparative Literature. And for the last three and a half years, I held an appointment as the Associate Director of the Institute for Arts and Humanities. So I got really interested in um, leadership around arts and humanities. It's something I feel really passionate about, the need to support arts like um, filmmakers like Yi Chen. And um, there was a leadership opportunity that opened up here at the University of Colorado Boulder to direct their humanity center. So I applied and um, left the US South, which also meant leaving a research agenda because I think in the interview um, in first vote, I talk a lot about this class that I taught at UNC, the place of Asian Americans in the US South. And I don't know that I'm ever gonna teach that class again now that I'm no longer located in the US South. <laughs> And I'm in the Rocky Mountain West. Um, but I will say as a Californian, so my family is in the San Francisco Bay Area, I am personally happy to be one time zone away instead of three time zone zones away. Um, but I will say I married a Southerner, so my husband's family is back in Raleigh, so North Carolina is always gonna be home. Mm, I see. Well, congratulations on, on your new job. It's um, quite an achievement. Um, Thank you. No, no, not at all. So um, I wanted to talk about some complex issues today and I wanted to start off with white supremacy. Uh, would you please tell us like, or explain to us the concept of white supremacy and how it um, pertains to Asian Americans? Thank you. Yeah, it's. I think in order to understand anything around race and racism in the United States, we really have to start with white supremacy. And I think there's a lot of confusion in the general public about what that means, because I think when people hear white supremacy, they are imagining the KKK, right? Guys in white sheets, so they're imagining neo-Nazis, um, proud boys, right? The class of what I will call professional white supremacists, right? People who, if they're not exactly making their living from being, um, people who are espousing white supremacist ideas are certainly putting their whole being, right, their whole identity into promoting white supremacy and this idea that white people are the superior race, that European history should be the, um, is tied to Western civilization and that should be the only history or the main history that's being taught. Um, and then in general, um, is anti-diversity, um, anti-critical race studies, et cetera, et cetera, right? So those are the professional class of white supremacists, professional racists, we can think of them. White supremacy, as I understand it as a critical race scholar, is an ideology, right? So this is a set of beliefs um, that also align with a certain kind of value, but more importantly, a type of structure, right? And it's a structure that, we do and don't have control over as individuals, right? So meaning we live in the United States, the United States is a capitalist society. I can choose to say, I don't believe in capitalism and I don't wanna support a capitalist society, but in practicality, that is nearly impossible to do, right? What that would mean is I would have to find a piece of land that I squat on, right? Cause if I don't believe in capitalism, I don't believe in buying that land. Right. I'd have to figure out, a clean water source. I would have to figure out how to get food, how to clothe myself, right? And, and we're talking about somebody who's off the grid. And so again, I would have to talk about building everything myself, right? Which again, begs the question of like, you can't just go to Home Depot and pick up nails, right? So how are you going to live off the grid? You could certainly try and find found objects to build a structure. I mean, I, I'm not trying to be silly about this, I'm, but I'm suggesting that um, as much as I may decide I don't believe in capitalism, to say that in the confines of the United States, it's really in practicality nearly impossible to live outside of capitalist bounds. So similarly, the United States was a nation founded on the belief that 
European Americans were the real Americans. And it was founded by taking land from the indigenous population that was here and settling on it, right? So this is why we hear terms like settler colonialism. So this ideology of white supremacy, this ideology that people from certain parts of Europe, right? And really we're talking about Western and to a certain degree, Northern Europe were kind of like the true American settlers who got to be US citizens. And so this ideology of white supremacy, right? Of who is seen to be a real American got, got put into not just the founding documents of the constitution and, um, and the US and how the US government was founded, right? But also in things that you don't necessarily have to have laws for, right? So it's in the culture. So for example, my grandparents, would often refer to white people as Americans, right? So I had a roommate who was white and they would refer to her not as my white roommate, but my American roommate. And I had a roommate who was Japanese American and they never called her the American roommate, right? Even though she was also born in the United States and just happened to be Japanese American, she was the Japanese roommate, right? Because in my grandparents' formulation, nation and ethnicity were kind of one and the same. Does this make sense? So the, our idea is that to be an American means to be a white American and that everyone else is hyphenated comes out of this idea of white supremacy. So white supremacy is as an ideology, it's in these structures, it's in these institutions, right? So if we look back historically to who US presidents have been, right? US presidents have been white men. Um, who has traditionally been allowed to vote? Um, again, white men and then every other category that we have now has has had to be added right we needed a whole amendment to let women for example have the right to vote so i mean i can keep going on and on about white supremacy but i i hope that helps people understand that i think it's not that individual people are racist and let me also say this the way that i think about racism is as a structure not that people individually are racist aside from the class of professional racists, right? So you and I can have ideas that are anti-Black and people may call us racist, right? For having those ideas. But it, I think what is more accurate to say is that we have bought into a system of anti-Black racism and we are perpetuating potentially anti-Black racism through the things that we say and do. And the reason it's important to take that I think is important to take identity out of the equation is that any one of us, regardless of what our actual racial or ethnic identity may be, can do and say racist things, right? So I can do and say racist things. But similarly, anyone regardless of their ethnicity or race can do and say anti-racist things. And that's really the most important thing that I feel I need to share as a critical race scholar is that anti-racism is not about who you are. Anti-racism is a choice, right? So it's not the same as not being racist. Not being racist is just you're being a decent human being. But to be anti-racist means consciously choosing to know about the true history, right? This history of settler colonialism, this history of, of anti-Black racism through the transatlantic slave trade and then to do something about this knowledge by saying and doing things as an anti-racist. Thank you for that answer. And it's funny that you mentioned your grandma saying that because I'm a first generation immigrant. And when we first came here, everyone that was white, we would call them white Gordon. And then everyone else of other ethnicities, like you said, we would call them and everything like that. So I experienced the same thing. So I guess in that vein, um, you know, going to current events, there's been a, like a recent explosion, you know, in the hate crimes, uh, violent harassment against Asian Americans in America because of COVID-19, which you, you know, have written about in, in depth as well. Um, in my city alone, there's been a 1900% increase in um, hate crimes against Asians. Um, do you think the fight against like the pandemic related harassment with you know, has largely fallen on civil rights group marketing agencies, which have promoted hashtags like I am not COVID-19, racism is a virus, health not hate, and hashtag make noise today. To what extent do you think that's effective? Yeah, I'm, I guess, you know, the first place to start is that I am so appreciative of various nonprofit groups like Stop AAPI Hate. And I'm 
certainly as the president of the Association of Asian American Studies, I'm very grateful and appreciative to various scholars who have taken it upon themselves to really address the harassment, the violence, and to contextualize it in this longer history of anti-Asian racism, which is directly tied to yellow peril rhetoric, right? Starting from the earliest waves of Asian, um, Asian uh, immigrants and settlers coming into the United States, which really we can date back to the mid 19th century with Chinese immigrants, um, largely men coming to, to mine for gold in California, right? So um, do, I guess one of the questions would be, do I think there should be more policing? Do I want more government intervention in addressing um, this anti-Asian violence that is happening? The policing part is really tricky. And I will say personally, I believe in the mantra defund the police. And I wanna be really careful here, because again, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding of what a phrase, def what phrases like defund the police means. So when people say defund the police, they are not necessarily saying abolish the police, although there, there are factions who do believe we should just get rid of all policing. But the defund the police movement is a recognition of the way that police departments first of all, were founded out of anti-Black racism. So the first kind of notion of modern policing really stems from um, slave patrols, people in the US South who formed into these bands of police to try and capture enslaved Black people who um, were either trying to escape or honestly were just going about their lives and then they were being harassed. And that last part, right, going about their lives and being harassed, we can see a direct line from the time, the antebellum times of slavery in the United States to the present day. So recently, Elijah McClain, who who's, um, was um, a young man who was in Aurora, Colorado, which is just an hour away from where I live, um, there was a, a report that found that the police had no right to stop, detain, and arrest him. Um, and that I think is saying a lot, right? That this independent report that came out of the city of Aurora recognized that the police had no business stopping detaining and arresting Elijah McClain. And in doing so, they cost him his life. And I think there has to be repercussions for that. Now, I know I'm spending a lot of time talking about anti-Black racism, but I guess the, what I'm saying is that Asian Americans, like Black Americans, are subject to white supremacy, right? What Asian Americans and Black Americans have in common is that they are um, groups who are not white, who are subject to this white supremacist ideology, and therefore subject to the kind of systemic racism, um, in the case of the Asian American population, that has been um, in existence from the mid 19th century forward. And one of the biggest ways we see this is the restrictive immigration and naturalization laws that were developed specifically to prevent Chinese and then other Asian, uh, Asians from entering into the United States with the passage of the 1882 Exclusion Act. So I'm going back that far in time to kind of explain all of the ways that Asians have been subject to state violence and that it's been um, kind of a narrative that is running through US history that we just don't know about because this does not get taught. We do not get taught things like the 1882 Exclusion Act. Um, I think people are finally talking about the Japanese American incarceration, but there's so many more restrictive laws and um, ways that Asians in America have been minoritized, have been victimized, have been subject to state violence, have been subject to interpersonal violence that people don't know about, which is why Asian American studies as an academic discipline has been so integral to getting this history out there. And then, address so if we know the history, then we can kind of understand how this current wave of anti-Asian violence fits into a much longer history of the way that Asians have been subject to white supremacist ideology. And I think the answer to addressing anti-Asian racism is not to rely on policing that has roots in anti-Black racism, but rather to think of other types of community-based solutions, as well as cultural and educational awareness so that we can get people to be active bystanders. So that if you see harassment happening, you step in mm -hmm. and you protect the victim and you create a culture in which it is not okay. Certainly it's never okay to harm anyone. Right. Um, 
but you all, it's not okay to say certain things. And with the last presidential, you know, administration that we had, I mean, clearly that was an administration that was certainly not just fine with the kind of anti-Asian harassment, but were, were part of causing that through the rhetoric of calling COVID-19, China virus, Kung flu, Wuhan, Wuhan flu. So I guess, you know, in connection with that, um, you talk about, um, you discuss, you know, you're, you're talking about black racism and Asian, Asian racism. So I guess in that, you know, in connection with that, um, you discuss something called a competition of suffering in an interview with the Asian American Institute. And I read the other day that many Asian Americans, they don't feel comfortable coming forward and saying, you know, there's racism against Asians because they feel like the racism against us Asians isn't as bad as against Black people. So what are your thoughts on that matter? Yeah, I want to contextualize because, um, I mean, I, I don't dispute that I might have used that phrase, but I think I might have been using that phrase in a very particular context. So mm -hmm. I don't believe that we solve things by getting into an oppression Olympics. But having said that, I also think it would not be accurate for me as an Asian American scholar and critical race scholar not to recognize that the kind of state violence and interpersonal violence that Black people um, have experienced historically and continue to experience to this day is exactly the same as Asian Americans. And I think while I think what's important is to recognize that there's a, there's a difference, right? There's a difference between me getting pulled over by police and a friend of mine who's Black getting pulled over by police. And that our reactions based on the longer history of how police have treated Asians versus Black people will also be different. Even while I recognize that, you know, all of this also depends on who the Asian driver is, right? So if we're talking about an Asian immigrant driver who has had a number of very violent and traumatic interactions with police wherever they're from, whether that's in the United States or elsewhere, their reaction may be similar, right? To a black American driver who's also experiencing this kind of, you know, real fear of being targeted by police. Um, the thing I think that's important, and I've spoken to various student groups about this, right? Because Asian American students are notably and rightfully so very anxious about being targeted because of COVID-19 and very anxious about the exponential rise of anti-Asian violence that's happening. But they also are feeling like they're not sure how to talk about this, right? They're certainly not sure about how to talk about this in mixed racial spaces because they don't wanna seem like they are taking away from the very, vital and necessary conversation about anti-Black racism that's happening. And what I want to encourage all of us to think about is our capacity for compassion and that that capacity is not finite. So in other words, I can have compassion for myself and not wanting to face anti-Asian racism, and I can have compassion for my friends and my family who are Black and not wanting them to face anti-Black racism, right? Both of these things can be true. And I can have compassion for my Latinx family and friends who are also suffering in various ways. And so I, I feel like what we need to remember is that this is not a zero sum game. And that again, what all racisms have in common is that they are subject to white supremacy. Right. So I. I think that also connects to um, something that you're very well versed in, which is the model minority myth. And you suggest, well, not you said you and other scholars suggest, and I think research has also proven this, that it's it's a myth and it actually hurts Asian Americans um, in, in general. So would you briefly explain what the model minority myth is, why it hurts Asian Americans, and what we in the Asian um, American community can do, and our viewers as well, to dispel this myth? Sure, so the model minority myth is, is essentially this idea that somehow there is something exceptional about who Asian Americans are that make them the better minority, right? And we're talking about race here. So um, it sounds like, like a compliment, right? It sounds like we're saying like, yay, Asian Americans are successful, right? And you know, these are positive stereotypes. We're good at math, we're you know, high achieving, we have high socioeconomic status. The problem with all stereotypes is that they're 
yes, there may be a grain of truth, but it doesn't cover the full range and the complexity of who Asian Americans are. And if you actually start to drill down into specific Asian um, ethnic groups, it's a lie, right? So South Asian, South East Asian immigrants in particular have some of the lowest literacy rates, English literacy rates, some of the lowest high school graduation rates, some of the lowest socioeconomic um, status. Um, and that's also true for um, Pakistani and Bangladeshi um, ethnic groups. Okay, so, so one of the things is that it's simply not true, right? It's not true that every Asian American is high succeeding. And if you can imagine an Asian American who is working class or working poor hearing, right, about the model minority myth, right, is also like kind of a terrible thing. Like you're thinking like, oh, I'm supposed to be successful because I'm an Asian. How come I'm not successful, right? Okay, so that's point number one. The, but the most important thing to understand about the model minority myth was that this is not a creation of the Asian American population, right? So it's not like a bunch of Asian Americans got together and said, yay, we're so much better than every minority group. This was a term that was created by a white journalist in the 1960s, specifically in praise of Japanese Americans. And he did this as a way not to single out Japanese Americans for the sake of singling them out, but to single them out in a way so that he could then point the finger at Black Americans. And so he says, look at these Japanese who are model minorities, right? They, we put them into these concentration camps. A lot of them didn't know good English. They came out, they didn't cause problems. Um, they worked hard. They put their kids through school. They're not causing trouble the way that these black people are, right? They're a model minority, unlike these black people who are fighting for civil rights. And so this term model minority was created specifically as a term of coercion, right? Not to praise Asians, but to try and punish Black, Latinx, and Indigenous people. And I think anytime you start to really think about that, like, oh, this is a term not because white people thought Asians were a better minority, right? White people want to use Asians as a better minority because they want to put down these other racial minority groups. So if you understand the kind of the kind of foundations of how the model minority myth was perpetuated, then no one should, should want to have anything to do with the model minority myth because you are essentially perpetuating a history of white supremacy and a history specifically of anti-Black racism. So it's also, um, it's also oppressive, it seems, to Asian Americans as well because it forces us or it motivates us to be silent in order to stay in that the good graces, right? And to stay in the model minority and continue to get special treatment. So in, in, a, in a way it's also oppressive as well as all the other detrimental things that you mentioned as well. Absolutely, um, yeah. So I just wanna to touch upon one more thing um, cause I know you're quite busy. Um, as a first generation, American, uh, first generation Chinese immigrant um, who lived below the poverty line when I first got here, like many immigrants, um, I discovered from a very young age to protect and shield my parents from racism, I had to act more American um, and to deflect against the racism. So it felt like a, a little bit like performative on my part. So to what extent do you think being an Asian American in America is a performative act, if at all? You know, that's a really great question. Um, I, I think it's, it's hard to say because um, I certainly understand and respect your experience. And I think your experience is really similar to a lot of, um, you know, 1.5, I think is what we would call you, right? Somebody who came over here as a young age and kind of had to act as a translator and act as someone who could be a buffer between um, American society and your parents who may not have been able to navigate um, US society, the English language, right? In the way that, you know, we, we typically expect. Um, but that wasn't my experience, right? So, and I'm not saying one is better or worse. I'm just saying like, the idea of anything being a performance is always gonna be true, right? So in other words, there's a way in which my identity as a professor can be said to be a type of performance. The way that I show up in an interview is um, similar to the way that I show up in other interviews when I'm asked to use my professional expertise. And so we could say that that's a performance, but I guess a couple of things, right? Just because something may be performative doesn't necessarily mean that it's negative. Um, 
I think we have a tendency to think about to kind of to think of things on a binary or, or along a continuum, right? With authenticity on one end and then performativity or inauthenticity at the other end. But I actually don't know that that's really true, right? Like a lot of people code switch um, for a variety of reasons, because I think that we, we put on different hats depending on the different cultural context that we find ourselves in. So while it may be true that Asian American identity is seen as a performance or is experienced as performative for various people like yourself, I think for other people, it might just be the way that you show up in the world. So for example, I primarily identify as Asian American rather than Chinese American or Chinese Jamaican, which are the other terms that my family members can and have used. And I say that not in any way to say that the way that my family identifies is wrong, but simply to say that the way that I perceive being Asian American as a term born out of social justice and as one that I think really encompasses the complexity and the contradictions of what it means to be an Asian living in America is one that I really identify with. So it doesn't feel performative to me. It just sort of feels like the skin that I live in. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I understand that for others, right, the central way that you may want to feel like you live in the world is as a woman or as Chinese or as a Mandarin speaker or as a mother. And I think, again, kind of going back to compassion, I believe as human beings, we are capable of complexity. And in being capable of complexity, we are also capable of enormous compassion and that we should try and have as much compassion for ourselves and for each other as we are navigating the different spaces that we find ourselves in and showing up in the various identities that we have. Thank you so much for that answer. Uh, I know our time is up for today. I learned so much from you. Uh, I just wanna thank you for joining us today on Liberated Panda. I hope we can have you back um, again uh, in the future and I, I wish you well. And uh, do you have anything else that you would like to say to our viewers? Um, yeah, so you can see in my name that there's a Twitter handle. Um, I've had to lock down my Twitter account because I, um, I tweeted something that I thought was totally obvious about critical race theory, and then some people lost their minds about it. So I had to lock down because I was getting a lot of hate. Oh. Um, but if you send me a, a request to follow, then um, you can follow me. And if you go to my my Twitter site, the pinned tweet has a Google form. And if you fill out the Google form, I'm happy to send you a PowerPoint presentation that I've done that talks about anti-Asian racism and COVID-19. And the last two pages have resources for anti-racism and kind of further reading about, um, about critical race theory and just you know getting yourself educated about race in the United States. Yeah, and I'll be happy to provide um, your Twitter handle and the link to that um, in the uh, description below. So thank you for joining us today, Professor Jennifer Ho. Um, and we uh, hope to see you viewers here next time on Second Gen's Liberated Panda. Have a great day, guys. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye, Jen.